Okay. Well, first let's uh, let's start with um, yeah. What I would like to do, I'd like to review a few things that we and wrap up uh, last lecture. Talk about that example that we've kind of finished up hurriedly on the board at the end of last class period, and then show you some things on uh, the computers here and the screens uh, that will hopefully solidify some of the concepts, because there was a lot going on yesterday, or uh, Tuesday. We basically played tennis, right? We started sending signals down the line and watching them go back and forth, back and forth, changing amplitudes and polarity with the reflection coefficients until finally you hit a steady state. And that steady state was basically the DC steady state that you were uh, familiar with all of these uh, months of doing circuit analysis the conventional way with lumped parameters. So let's go ahead. Let's get the overhead uh, camera going here. I will turn this on. And then we will switch to the laptop for about 10 minutes and review some material. And then we'll go back to the, the board doing our diagramming. Okay. Well, where we last, last left our story, I had hastily put the, the final kind of solution on the board for the problem that we were working. Recall what that was. We were looking at a transmission line with the following topology. There was a 5-volt source. A 10 ohm source resistance, pretty low. This was a 50 ohm intrinsic impedance line. And it was terminated with 100 ohms. And we said this connection was made at time equals to zero. And our final solution, when all was said and done, and all the reflections had shaken out of the system, was that if I measured the output voltage, V sub L here, as a function of time, and here I'm going to graph transit times here, capital T, which in our problem was one nanosecond. I'll just represent it with a capital T. This would be 2T, this would be 3T, 4T, 5T, and even have a 6T. So the solution we graphed the first thing we noted was that our VL was zero up until one transit time. It may seem like a simple concept, but it's very easy to mistake the fact that just because you make a change over here doesn't mean anything's going to change on the other side of the line until at least one transit time has elapsed. That will save you so many mistakes on your test. I can't tell you how many times that somebody tries to set, change something on the other end of the line, even though the topology is only changing on the opposite end of the line. So it, it will get there eventually, the change, but uh, immediately after, and that's sort of the key phrase in this class, immediately after, you know, femtoseconds afterwards, you're not going to get any change over here if you've made a switch change over here. And so there's this latency of T, one nanosecond in our circuit, which in and of itself is, a, is a, um, an effect of transmission lines that sometimes you have to take into account, right? If you're trying to coordinate the operations of logic switches uh, together, um, you know, a nanosecond is actually a pretty significant delay if you're doing things really high speed. So that in and of itself is kind of an interesting effect of transmission lines. But we saw something else happen too. The nice clean square wave that we wanted to put, the leading edge of the DC pulse at least, that we wanted to put on that line and propagate down at constant velocity, didn't look anything like a square wave at the terminus of this uh, transmission line. First of all, somehow we started out with a five volt waveform and when we got to the end of the line, it was 5.55 volts. And that was a little bit disturbing. That lasted for two transit times as the waveform reflected off, uh, doubled up almost, because we got a high impedance load here, and then took another transit time to go back down the line and then back towards the load. And then at that point it jumped down to the value of 4.32 volts, jumped back up, and I think it was a little bit like you know, 4.8 something volts at that point. And then at about seven transit times, 
it dropped back down. And you can see it's kind of asymptotically approaching the following value. Jump it up a little above, a little below, a little above, a little below. Asymptotically getting closer and closer. And that value, if we took this calculation off to infinity, which, which you will be doing with the geometrical series in your homework, doesn't that sound like fun? You get 4.55 volts. And it's really fascinating because it's a very complicated analysis we're doing. You know, We're taking a voltage, we're launching it down the transmission line, we're calculating our reflection coefficient. Some of it goes this way, some of it dumps across the load. It's going back and forth and back and forth. We do that infinite number of times, all to get the same solution as if we had used the steady state DC model for the transmission line. What is the steady state DC model for the transmission line? Yeah, that's right, two short circuit wires. So in other words, as a nice double check, if you ever do one of these problems and you can kind of make out you know, approximately what the voltage this thing is converging on, you can always quick double check it with the simple voltage divider circuit. We got five volts, 10 ohms in series with 100 ohms. My voltage divider says my VL across here should be 5 volts times 100 ohms over 100 plus 10 ohms. And what is that? Magic Professor calculator. Oh, 4.55 volts. Exactly what we got down here. In all this pain and effort just to get to the same real circuit that you could have solved like a year ago in your classes, right? But it's a good sanity check. It's interesting to note that there's, there's hardly any... Uh, oh, there, you, you didn't know this much was actually happening in your circuits, right? Obviously, you'd need some very expensive equipment to see these kind of nanoscale uh, temporal transients in the circuit. And for the most part, when you're dealing with low frequency, this suffices. You just ignore transmission line theory. Yeah. Uh, so if you were to look at that under scope, would it, would it be more curved? Yeah, so, so let me draw you kind of what it would look like on the scope. I should, if I was really a good professor, I'd, I'd be brave and I'd get a really high resolution scope down here and a long transmission line and I'd terminate it badly and I'd try to do a, a demonstration with hardware. But, you know, professors in hardware don't mix, right? Like, I have the best of intentions and it probably would blow up in my face uh, by the time I got down here. So we're, we're, I'm going to do this the old-fashioned way. This is probably what you would see on your scope. A, l a slight delay if we were in the absolute t equals zero time coordinates. And then this thing would pop up, and in the case that we've got there, it would kind of ring. We call that ringing. So we actually know two detrimental effects on a transmission line. Latency, which means the edge of my pulse is no longer coordinated with the time that it switched. Significant for logic circuits. And then this effect of ringing, where you can actually disturb the voltage here uh, of the leading edge, and it no longer looks like a clean um, square wave. In fact, you know, if you're trying to decide logic levels, you know, you're trying to interpret this waveform as a one or a zero, for example, you would make sure that you'd have to wait until after the ringing had subsided before actually trying to make your decision. As when this thing switches off, as we're going to learn later, it does the exact same thing. It'll ring with the same transient. Has anybody ever seen this in their co-ops or in the laboratory? Raise your hand if you've seen this before. Great, great. Can you tell me, uh, was it? Uh, did you see it in your co-op when you were uh, like working for a company or something? Yeah, when I worked at AT&T. Oh, AT&T. Man, that, so much of their business is just trying to get rid of ringing on the engineering side of things, right? What, what uh, context did you see it in? Uh-huh. Like uh, the twisted pair of uh, uh, or coaxial uh, cables. We did um, coax and some Ethernet cables. Some, uh, coax and Ethernet cables. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ethernet cables, you're sending data at hundreds of megabits per second or more. 
And uh, this is actually a big problem on those. The longer your cable gets, the more you risk mismatching the line and, and getting this kind of ringing transient, which can distort data. An excellent example uh, from the co-op at at and It was a co-op or internship? Co-op, cool. Cool. There's a, all, it, it, everybody that raises my hands is usually the co-op students that have, have seen ringing. We don't get to see it in the uh, actual lab at Georgia Tech until, unless you do some advanced stuff. Yeah? Um, what would increase or decrease the amount of ringing like, in this? Ah, uh, yeah, good question. And this is actually going to lead into our next discussion, our next unit on uh, the terminations of termination strategies for transmission lines. So what causes the ringing to persist for a long time really comes down to how big those reflection coefficients are. The closer your loads are to either infinity or short circuit um, on either side of the line, the longer the ringing persists, right? The, the, the higher the resistance, the closer to an open circuit it looks like, uh, the closer to positive one the reflection coefficient is. If the source side is close to a short circuit, you have an, almost an ideal uh, source, the closer to negative one right, that reflection coefficient is. And the signal just bounces around forever and it loses such little energy over time that you know, this thing could be persisting until the next symbol, which is a big problem. In fact, if it persists for a really long time, you're really introducing the concept of intersymbol interference, which is another detrimental effect of a transmission line that we'll talk in when we talk about short pulses on transmission lines. But that's basically the, the thing that does it. Badly mismatched lines. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'm going to do two things on the computer now. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to the overhead here. And I've got my laptop this time, so I'm pretty sure that projection will work. I want to introduce two things. One is a nice collection of animated videos to help kind of solidify the concepts in our minds. Um, it always helps to see things moving because we're dealing with waveforms that are a function of space and time simultaneously. Okay. Actually, there, there is a solution to that. These uh, uh, triangles are usually up there, but li li appear to have fallen on the floor. <laughs> It'll be weeks before somebody puts them back. No, I'll try to do it before, before the end of the class here. OK, here's a, here's a quick um, diagram of something that shows up in your book. This is a bounce diagram. It, if you're like me, you know, there, there's, everybody learns differently. Everybody has different styles for solving these transmission line problems. For me, I like to play tennis. I like to take my finger and like think, okay, this is the forward propagating wave, this is the backwards propagating wave, this is the next forward, the V plus plus, this is the V minus minus going back. I like I, I like just kind of keeping track of it that way by looking at the transmission line and, and doing V minus, V plus plus, V and so so uh, so forth. There's another technique, and I'll just mention it briefly because uh, it's in your book, and there's a portion of students that, like, that are like me and think, man, this does not help me one bit in understanding transmission lines. And there's always a subset of students that are like, man, I re this really helped me understand what was going on with all these crazy bounces. It's called a bounce diagram. Um, and the, basically, the way that you put it together, you put z equals zero over here and z equals d over here. And this sort of represents the length of your transmission line, this space dimension over here. In this dimension, going downward, you have time. And in order to model the leading edge of that DC pulse that gets switched onto the network, what you do is you draw a straight line uh, and, of course, you put the hash marks every transit time on your time axis. So you draw a straight line from z equals to zero up at the top left-hand corner to the first transit time, then a straight line to the second, straight line to the third. And as you move down in time in this direction, you can tell when events happen on this line. So, for example, if I start here at z equals zero and I start going down, when do the events happen? 
up at the source side? When, do I, when would I expect voltage changes? Well, it makes sense, right? Z equals zero, I made a switch, so change. I switched the uh, source into the network, so voila, I'm going to get a voltage there. And then I'm going to see something at two transit times, at four transit times, basically even numbers of transit times as it takes the signal to go down and reflect back and make a change at the source. Likewise, at the load, every odd transit time is when I see stuff. So I can kind of move down here. And on here, you can write down the amplitudes of your V plus and your I plus, your V minus and your I minus of the reflected wave, your V plus plus and your I plus plus amplitude and of your uh, second forward traveling wave, V minus minus and V I minus minus, and so forth and so on. So I, I just alert you uh, to this. There are a couple of these in your book in chapter 3 and they are very useful for some people to, to track what's going on. So I should probably do a survey at the end of class. Like, Who has a, uh, is really spoken to by bounce diagrams and who just likes to write stuff down and, and draw on transmission lines to figure it out? It'd be an interesting psychological evaluation. The number, there are some numbers on this slide, but uh, they don't correspond to the problem that we worked through. This is just clipped out of the book uh, just to demonstrate the structure of them. Yeah? Would you ask us this sort of thing on the test? Uh, no, no. This is a tool for the things that I will ask you on the test. Uh, but the, the test problems will bear more resemblance to the many practice tests that are online as well as the homework assignments. Generally speaking, test problems should be a little easier than homework assignments because you have a limited amount of time. And, so I tell you that ahead of time in case you're like really sweating over the homework and stressing out about the problems so far. This stuff is pretty weird the first time you see it. How many of you were up past midnight doing this um, homework? Good, good Georgia Tech students. How many, how many of you were up past 2 a.m. doing this homework? Hey, not bad, not bad. Uh, what, what, maybe, you don't remember, it, it was too painful. You've blocked it out. Well, that's not, not bad. Still early in the semester. That's good. Okay, so that's, that's one example. And what I'd like to do now, if possible, uh, let's see if I can get this uh, centered on the screen here. I apologize in ahead, of t if, uh, ahead of time if it's difficult to see this in the back. This is online if you want to repeat this little exercise in viewing transmission lines. But what I have here on one of the resources page is an animation of different lo differently loaded DC switch transmission lines. And so for example, I've got up here the DC match. And it animates in both space, the green curve is basically a voltmeter that is sort of perpetually drug across uh, the transmission line to view what the real-time voltage is as it travels down that line. And then the output voltage, the red line, is what would I would happen if I just hold, held a static voltmeter at the end there and looked at the load. At time equal to zero, that's when this thing switches into the network. I've got a voltage, I've got a generator resistance, and a load resistance. And in this particular problem, everything's 50 ohms. So conveniently, everything is matched. I send a wave down, it gets to the end, there's no reflection, and thus, after one transit time, I've already reached my DC steady state. So that's for the match. That's kind of boring. What happens if there is a poor match? Ooh, that kind of looks like the example we did in class. So this is a 50 ohm line. It's got 150 ohms at the load and 5 ohms at the source. So some mismatch. And this would be typical if you're presenting uh, a transmission line to TTL logic or a middle cu meter coupled logic or CMOS logic. Chances are the things that you're naturally driving or receiving signals from on transmission lines are going to be severely mismatched. And so what we see here, real time, is the reflected waves traveling back and forth, shaking out. And here's some, some ringing on the leading edge of the pulse, up and down, up and down. If the mismatch gets really bad, you can actually drop below 2.5 volts or whatever the half the value is of, of your logic level one. In some ways, it, if you make the wrong decision at your 
uh, at your uh, load, you can actually trick that device into thinking you sent something other than a logic one. It's a logic zero because it's below threshold. So you have to be careful. Okay, that's a poor mismatch. In the interest of <coughs> looking at a few other special cases, I've got a voltage here, switch in, switches into the network. I've got an open circuit in an otherwise matched circuit. This is 50 ohm transmission line, and I've got a 50 ohm source. So I send a waveform down. It doubles up because I have a reflection coefficient of positive 1, and it comes back. And then, because there's no reflection after this, it's reached a steady state. How does it come back to this? If it's open, well, remember, it's a positive voltage, and it simply reflects 100% because there's literally no place to go, right? If I send a waveform down, I'm basically sending power that's traveling on the line downward. And open circuits don't absorb any power. There's no place for that power to go. So 100% of that power gets reflected back with a positive 1 reflection coefficient on the voltage. And it just dumps right back into the, the source. So it's interesting in that once you've hit the steady state, you've got just as much power traveling this way as traveling this way. And therefore, there's no net power transfer from source to load. And there better not be, because there's no place to go. However, uh, during that, that two transit time charge-up period, there is actually power going from the source into the transmission line. And the physical, uh, if you want to think in terms of physics, what's happening there is those intertwined inductances and capacitances are all charging up. And after two transit times, they're charged up. They've reached the DC transient state, steady state. And there's no more net power change in the system. Yeah, you have a question? What if it was a short thing? You should just get it all back to right? What if it was a short? It's like you're reading from the script. <laughs> Let's see. Where is my short circuit? Oh, yeah, there it is. Oh, look at that. That's right, that's right. 100% of the waveform gets reflected, but this time it's with a negative 1 reflection coefficient. Wave comes down, reflects with a negative 1 reflection coefficient, and winds up erasing itself. Now the current, if I were to show current as a function of time along the line, the opposite would happen. It would look like the short voltage of the short cir uh, open circuit case. The current would come down, double up, and come back, and I'd be left with steady state DC current, which is perfectly allowable in a short circuit line. But voila, steady state, zero voltage across this entire short circuited system. Again, the steady state is a trivial state that you could have analyzed early on in your electrical engineering careers. You just never knew that this is what actually happened to get to that state. Let's see, what else can we do? Let's see, high impedance. Oh, and this is a pulse. We haven't done short pulses yet, but uh, it's good to demonstrate. Here I've got a uh, high impedance transmission line and a low impedance load. All my reflection coefficients wind up being, uh, excuse, excuse me, high impedance source and load 50 ohm transmission line, 150 ohms here and here. All my reflection coefficients are positive, so you can see the waveform that I send down back and forth always has a positive amplitude. You'll notice that in the case of low impedance, here I've got 10 ohms and 10 ohms. The reflection coefficients are both negative. So you see the, the waveform is always flipping amplitudes as it travels down. And here's a better example at a different time scale of what ringing looks like. I've got a switch DC up, and I get ringing on the, the front side. And then when I turn it off, I get the same transient to go back to zero. And then if you wanted to see dispersion or inter-symbol interference, 
you put a short pulse on the line, a pulse that's much smaller than a transit time, you'll send it down and it will echo back and forth. So that if I look at the end of the line, what I see are copies of the pulse. Positive one, big negative one, big positive one. And this is problematic because this is, if this is a communications pulse carrying a bit, for example, what I'm doing is I'm injecting echoes into later periods in my bit stream. And that's really what intersymbol interference is. You basically are trying to decode a bit, but there's a whole bunch of other ghost bits in that uh, uh, bin of time, adding constructively or destructively and distorting your decision threshold. You'd like to set a decision threshold somewhere around here to see if it's a zero or a one, and lo and behold, this ghost bit has pushed your signal beyond the threshold and made, made you make a bad decision. Okay. Well, that'll do it for the computer. And like I said, if you had trouble in the back seeing these, these are all online off the website. So we'll switch back to the board now. Okay, so now let's start our next topic. Termination schemes. Okay, so here's the scenario. I've got some high-speed logic devices. Let's just represent them as NAND gates or something like that. Signal in. They've got an attachment to ground, generally speaking. And we're connecting them to another logical input. Let's say it's another NAND gate. I'm using all this complementary logic here. And how are we going to connect them? Well, at high speeds, there's going to be an electromagnetically significant transmission line linking the two with an intrinsic impedance. Let's call it Z0 equal to 50 ohms. And let's say for the sake of argument that uh, this thing here looks like a 5 ohm source impedance. And this device here has a 2K load resistance. So clearly there's some mismatch going here. If I wanted to write these in conventional circuit diagrams, I might write something like this. The feminine equivalent of those devices. If you want to get more comfortable with familiar circuit elements. Uh, yeah, you have a question? Uh, do you mean NOR? Yeah. Uh, NOR gate. Uh, let's see. I think that's an, is that a NOR or a NAND? NOR. Boy, it's been so long since I've taken that class. I think it was 16 years ago since I last did a logic circuit. Okay, NOR. NOR. What's, what's the NAND symbol? Oh, this, this straight line, right? Okay, okay. I always get those mixed up. This is why I'm in electromagnetics and not the computer engineering classes. Yeah? So the, the gates has the resistance? Yeah, so the, the devices that it would implement these gates, for example, um, you know, this might be a CMOS uh, chip connected to another CMOS chip. A lot of those logic circuits are implemented with NORs or NANDs, complementary type logic uh, gates. And the, the transistors that make up this device, the output impedance would be very low and the input impedance is very high. That's the scenario that we're modeling. Yeah? Um, like, is there a way to actually measure that in real life? The, like, um the 2K oh, sure, sure. Um, you know, in, in some ways what you can do, it, it depends because things can change at higher frequencies, but really all you have to do is just um, load this thing and look at this DC 
uh, current coming out of the device at maybe several different loads, and you can get what the Thevenin equivalent is. You know, drive a small load, drive a big load, and you can kind of back out what the uh, source impedance is. Likewise, you can hook up an ohm meter and measure the uh, input impedance of that device. And this, of course, is controlled by geometry that we talked about last week. So, okay. What's the strategy for, for um, matching this circuit? I'm going to put on here our strategy number one, the perfect match. This is how we do things in RF engineering. We say we want 50 ohm at the source and 50 ohms at the load. And I'm going to need a 51.3 ohm resistor. These two things in series are 50 ohms. These two things in parallel are 50 ohms. Match over here, so nothing's going to reflect off. If there are any backwards propagating waveforms, a match is going to be here. I told you in the world that I like to deal with quite a bit uh, RF engineering. That's how we do it. We make sure everything's 50 ohms, so you don't ever have to worry about reflections. Now, for logic circuits, this is a terrible way to do things, and there are two glaringly terrible reasons why this is bad. Can anybody think of what they are? So it would be my inclination for matching the circuit if I had seen this for the first time. What are the two drawbacks of this technique? Okay. Let's, let me give you hint number one. Let's say this is a 5 volt logic source. Put in the steady state after all the reflections have uh, shaken themselves out of the system. I, I replace this with two lines. What is my load voltage at that point? Two and a half volts. I lost half of my voltage because I had to match the circuit on both sides. Like I would like something that's close to five volts because generally speaking when you're doing logic uh, levels, you, if you're using five volt logic, you want to keep all your ones at five volts or as close as possible and then all your zeros as close to zero as possible. What I got here is something halfway in between. Easier to corrupt by noise even if I set my thresholds lower. So that's, that's kind of philosophically a bad thing to do in a logic, logical circuit. What's another bad thing that has happened? Okay, I'll give you a hint. If there is a current, I sub S, leaving that source, this is the introduced resistance. I had to plop a resistor down to match that. This is the device itself. Which of these resistors is absorbing more power? Yeah, this one that I just dropped in. It's nine times bigger, so you know I, losses are I squared R. This is nine times more power absorptive than that one. I go over to the load side. I got a load resistor. Two of them in parallel. This is the one that I introduced. This is in the intrinsic one of the device. Which one is absorbing more power? Yeah, the second one that I introduced. It's sucking up almost all the power. So I've got these two for lack of a better word, space heaters in my circuit, heating things up, wasting power. On the plus side, I do get a match out of it. And so our matching strategies are gonna, that we're going to introduce next are going to remove some of these problems. So let's go to matching scheme number two. This one will be slightly better. We'll call this the series match. We recall, let's have a 5 volt logic source 
And what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave that 45 ohm intentional resistance in there. <coughs> and then I'm just going to let my 2 kilo ohm resistor stay by itself on the load, the intrinsic impedance of my device that I'm feeding. And the strategy here is to note that really in order to clean up this waveform at the output, I only need one of these sides to be matched. There's a bad mismatch at this junction, but the reflected wave will not come back to do any harm on my signal fidelity if it comes back to here because it'll see a, a matched circuit and just dump without reflection onto the low, uh, source side. And you can see what this, the, the benefit of this is it's very simple. All I need is one resistor. Another benefit is that I get a pretty significant voltage at steady state out here. If you look at the circuit in the DC equivalent, I've got 50 ohms in the total series resistance here. My transmission line becomes short circuit bars after waiting out the transient. And I've got 2 kilo ohms over here. If I do my voltage divider, I get a great voltage amplitude out here. 4.88 volts. That's, for all intents and purposes, 5 volts to an engineer. I still have not kind of solved my, my energy problem in the sense that this device is still burning up a significant amount of power. However long this pulse lasts, this thing is going to just churn and, and uh, make ohmic losses in my devices, which is significant. It wastes power, and especially nowadays when thermal issues are such a big deal in high-speed logic, you don't want to be putting devices in there that are uh, going to be soaking up a lot of uh, heat or producing a lot of heat. Okay. Well, in that same vein of thought, though, Let's cover one more thing. We call this the parallel match. And this is where I do the opposite. I leave my source with a 5 ohm resistor, the intrinsic output impedance of the device, and I put the parallel match, my 51.3 ohms, at the end of the line in parallel with my 2 kilo ohm intrinsic load. This collectively looks like a 50 ohm load. So when I send the waveform down, there is no reflection at that junction. So I don't really have to worry about how badly mismatched this junction is. Again, the same benefits as the series match. It only takes one resistor. It's a simple match to design and implement. But again, I have some power absorption issues here at the load. This thing is still going to, this little resistor here is still going to absorb a lot of power. And so if power consumption is an issue, you might want to use some of these other matches that I'll talk about in the next two that I introduce. But again, in this one, I've got 5 volts, DC steady state. Once the reflections have shaken out in this circuit, which there clearly won't be, I have 5 ohms in series with 50 ohms. If I do my voltage divider, I get, let's see, what do I get? Fifty over five plus fifty times my five volts, uh, so that winds up being about four point five five volts. Not quite the the value that I got over there, four point eight eight, but that's close enough to five volts where we could use that as a definitive logic uh, symbol. Okay, now things get a little more interesting. look at something a little more complicated. A 
Let's see, what are we on? Number four? Method number four. Capacitor termination. And this is quite clever. I'm going to take my transmission line here. This is my NOR gate. And I put this network at the end of my line. I shunt the line with a Z0 resistance in series with a capacitor. Okay, so what happens here? I've got a dead circuit and then all of a sudden I excite it. A voltage waveform comes down the line and when it gets to the end, what kind of impedance does it see here? Zero. Like, Oh my goodness. Yeah, Z0. Z0. Well, how is that possible? Remember, the capacitor, when it's discharged and you first hit it with the DC waveform, it looks like a short circuit. It doesn't stay that way for long. It exponentially charges up until you get to a, um, a saturation value. But when this wave first hits, that capacitor is going to be a short. Which means what I really have is Z0 in parallel with something big, like 2 kilo ohms, which is effectively Z0. Any little thing in parallel with a big thing is always just the little thing, right? Approximately. Which means I don't get a reflection at that junction. However, over time, the capacitor is going to charge up and effectively it's going to become an open circuit which removes the effect of the shunt. So what I am left with it's just my 2 kilo ohm resistor. And this is a sneaky way to have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> right? Because your final transient state, your DC state, has just a 2 kilo ohm resistor and a 5 ohm source impedance or low ohm source impedance. You're not wasting any power on matching resistors. Only for a very brief time, the time it takes to suppress the initial reflection. There'll be a slight distortion on the line because as this thing charges up, there might be a little bit of transient. But the initial reflection is suppressed and that's always the worst one. And so you get a very clean waveform at, this, at the load using this capacitor. Yeah? It's probably stupid. I might be wrong, but after a long time, won't the capacitor become short though once it's charged? No, the, the opposite happens. At, at the first, it looks like a short. In the long term, it always becomes an open. Yeah, so initially it's a short as it starts to charge. And then, remember, a plat capacitor is just really just two plates. Once you charge it up to a steady state voltage, there's no way you can get current across it. You can't change the E field, and you can't get physical charges across the insulator gap. So remember, it's... It's always, uh, it's always a good rule of thumb to know in the class, right? Open circuit when you hit DC on a capacitor initially, it always becomes short circuit in the long run. It's the opposite of an inductor, which always looks like an open circuit when you first hit it with the DC waveform, and then becomes a short circuit once you've been sitting there for a while and after you've done charged it up. Yeah? Oh, but the, wouldn't that make that slower? Because once the, the like, pulse is gone, they like, wouldn't they keep a voltage there because the capacitor is charged? Uh, yeah, the, there'll still be a voltage there once this charges away. And it'll be a voltage that matches whatever's across the 2 kilo ohm resistor. But that's okay. We don't, we don't care. Uh, when the, the voltage is removed, removed, there will be the same kind of transient. And again, you'll be able to superimpose the effect of a capacitor with a short circuit there and it'll charge up to the new transient value and suppress the reflection that way. Here's a question for all you computer engineers and, and chip designers. What's easier to make on a chip, a resistor or a capacitor? Resistor or a capacitor? It depends. It depends on how big the capacitor is, right? Capacitor is actually very easy to implement on a chip, right? They're just pieces of metal. 
so, uh, with uh, insulator or undoped semiconductor in between them. Resistors is, uh, of calibrated value is actually kind of difficult to make on semiconductors. You can, you know, dope a channel and kind of quarantine off a certain geometry to get a certain resistance, a length, and a cross-sectional area. But it can be a little trickier to get a calibrated value. So, but yeah, you know, both of these are implementable on uh, on an integrated circuit. A clever, elegant little match for your for your transmission line. What is maybe one of the drawbacks of using this scheme? Is if we're taking care of the power consumption problem, what? Well, maybe if you were working at too high a frequency, you would the capacitor wouldn't get a chance to discharge between pulses. Yeah, that's exactly right. Unlike the first two schemes that he, he's got, he's nailed it perfectly. Unlike the first two schemes that we've covered. There is a cutoff frequency at which this won't work. By introducing a capacitor into the, uh, the circuit, there is going to be some rate of clocking that uh, you will not be able to finish charging this up before the next pulse hits or the next change in the voltage state hits. So you've put a frequency dependence uh, in your matching circuit that doesn't exist in the purely resistive cases. Just requires a... Uh, uh, an engineer that can pick an RC time constant properly, right? It's an example of how to use your 2040 knowledge. Yeah? Okay, so I'm just trying to like, clarify my understanding of this. Uh -huh. So you have Z0 and it only sees Z0 initially. Mm -hmm. So it's Z0 in parallel with the 2K, so it's approximately Z0. So That's right. There's no reflection coming back. That's right. There, and then for basically matched. So it's getting five volts across the low pitch one of them. That's right. It looks like this, which is a match circuit initially, mm -hmm. and then it transitions to this. So when, the, when there's the potential for the biggest reflection, it suppresses it completely. And then finally, there will be, once you get to here, there will be a backwards propagating waveform, but it's a smooth transition. It's not this ringing phenomenon that we've been looking at. So this is just a little bit of ripple. Okay, so to get the voltage across the 2K number that's going back, it's going to take all um, the power from the capacitor? Uh, there will be an interplay of, of uh, once this thing starts charging up, there's going to be a transient where power will be going to both of these, res uh, the resistance here on the device and the re through the resistor here, but this leg will slowly dry up. And all the en at the end, all the power is going to be dumped to the high impedance output. As a, in addition to, at that point, returning value uh, energy to the circuit, there will be a reflected waveform in the steady state. But you've, you've suppressed the really bad transient at the start of the circuit. OK, well, if you thought that one was complicated, just wait until you see the diode termination. Now, some of you may not have even seen diodes yet. How many people have not taken 3040 yet? Oh, usually by this time, everybody's either taken it concurrently or have already, has already taken it. How many wish you had never heard of 3040? Okay, good, yeah. That's, that's also standard. That's also standard. That's a good class, though. Good class. Well, this is, uh, I'm going to introduce a device that maybe you probably saw in that class. A diode, specifically a Zener diode. So here, I've got my source. It's connected to a transmission line, sending a pulse down at T equals to zero. Say it's five volts. And what terminates it terminates in a, let's just draw it, you know it's a device, two kilo ohm load. And then I put this network in. Check this out. Zener diode. Shunt it across the, the end there to ground from terminal to ground 
with a calibrated reverse breakdown voltage of, say, negative 5.2 volts. And since we usually measure voltage net polarity across the diode the way it's drawn, that basically means whenever there is a 5.2 voltage overage in, across this uh, diode from top to bottom, you'll clip the waveform. And then you have another one that has the same reverse breakdown potential connected to your 5 volt source. So two diodes, and remember diodes are really easy to make on integrated circuits, right? They're just uh, a PN junction that in this case is calibrated to break down, doped in a special way so that it break that breaks down at about 5 volts. Well, what do we mean by breakdown? Let's review that terminology real quick so we understand how this works. Diodes, unlike resistors and capacitors and inductors, are highly nonlinear devices. And they don't have any memory, so that makes it a little easier to deal with. And whenever we're dealing with a nonlinear, memoryless device like a diode, we always characterize it with a VI curve in electrical engineering. So here's my diode. I've got V measured across from the back side of the triangle drop to the front side tip of the triangle and then my current is defined this way in the typical diode model. And the diode curve looks something kind of like this. Where ideally, ideally of course what we'd really like it to look like is a switch. An ideal switch. Like this. Basically, any voltage that's positive, the thing looks like a short circuit. Any voltage that's negative, it looks like an open circuit. Well, that's not actually how it happens in real life. It's pretty close. You gotta have a turn on voltage to kind of get it past the, the, uh, the edge of the curve. We call this V turn on. And likewise, it's not a perfect open circuit on the backside if you reverse bias it. There's a small reverse saturation current that leaks through that side. But for all intents and purposes, this acts like a switch. Now, I haven't drawn it very realistically. Every diode, if you put enough voltage through it, reverse uh, voltage, that is negative voltage from here to here, voltage drop. That pushes the input, uh, the voltage across there further and further back and eventually you get to a point where the diode just can't take it anymore. It's like a valve that breaks. It doesn't physically break and that once you lower the voltage it'll restore its proper electrical um, shape. But once you surpass that voltage you just get an avalanche of current and this is called reverse breakdown. All diodes have it, but of course the diode that I've drawn in the matching circuitry over there is a special kind of diode we call a Zener diode. And you put this little squiggle in front of the Zener diode uh, schematic to denote that it has a calibrated reverse breakdown. So, you, you know, if you go to a Radio Shack or uh, Mauser Online or any of these online uh, distributors, you get a diode out of there, you put it in a curve tracer, you'll see the reverse breakdown potential. Uh, and if it's not a Zener, uh, that potential, if you pick it out of the same bin, different devices out of the same bin, will wiggle around. However, the Zener diode has a very well calibrated, both because it was manufactured that way and also because they usually bin out the results that come off the manufacturing line. So if there is a 5 volt Zener diode, you know that at 5 volts, that's when this reverse saturation curve kicks in. Okay, so armed with this knowledge, this quick review of electronic principles, let's go over here and figure out how this thing works. I send a waveform down by connecting this to the circuit. It's going to be close to 5 volts because I've got 5 ohms in parallel with a 50 ohm transmission line. So my initial waveform is going to be pretty close to 5 volts. If that Zener wasn't there, 
I'd have almost like an open circuit. Two kilohms is a pretty big resistor. The reflection co coefficient is going to be large, 0.9 something. Which means my voltage is going to double up and I'm going to get a huge ring come out of it. But wait a second. My voltage can't double up at the end of this line. Because as soon as this thing is over 5.2 volts, current is going to start dumping down the Zener diode, as much of it as you want, because it's just going to hang there on that Zener reverse breakdown voltage. It can't surpass it. It's just going to dump as much current as it takes to uh, keep that voltage at negative 5.2. Or, yeah, 5.2 this way. And so, effectively what you're doing is sawing off any, any ringing that's going on. And then this guy up here is meant to do the same thing on the other side. Whenever there's, if, if you make a downward transition, the thing will want to ring really low and it, this diode will kick in and saw off anything that goes below zero voltage on the output of this transmission line. So on the leading edge of the pulse, or even the falling edge of the pulse, these two little diodes, without even the use of resistors or capacitors, will effectively saw off and make sure everything stays at 5 volts or 0 volts. It's kind of the best of all the worlds, right? Not wasting too much power. Device that's easy to put into a circuit, into an integrated circuit. Not frequency dependent, really although you do have to worry about the frequency characteristic of your diodes. Yeah? So we're going to see an output voltage across the two pairs, or like the load at 5.2. <laughs> yes, 5.2, you know, something close to there. Essentially 5 to an engineer. So before, I guess, when we had our, uh, is our standard, Example and it uh, it averaged out to what 4.55, mm -hmm. and now we're actually going to come out with more than what we started with. Uh, well, because this is tied into the source, that's potentially true. We could have, uh, um, you know, maybe slightly more in, in the double up. It, it's going to be really close to five. That's the key. 5.2, 4.8. I don't think any logic designer would quibble over those voltage levels. 2.5 would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Seven would be un unwarranted. Yeah, welcome. So what would make you choose one type of match over the other? Um, it, it may come down to uh, your processing techniques or, or your availability of components. For example, if all of this is going to be uh, packaged in an integrated circuit, the key question that you'll want to ask is what process am I using? And under that process, is it easier and cheaper and more space effective to use to design capacitors, resistors, or Zener diodes? The capacitor match might actually be a really nice match until you find out that the capacitor size that you need is really big. What's the trade-off when it's really big? Well, that means I'm taking up a lot of space on my chips. And when I go to make my chips, I put all the same chip on a big wafer. And if I have big capacitors, I may get 30,000 chips out of that big wafer. If I have a small capacitor, I might be able to get 60,000 chips out of that wafer, which means I've just doubled my profit. Wafers are expensive. The whole idea is the only way to get uh, your money's worth out of them is to make a lot of devices, fit as many devices on the, the semiconductor wafer as possible. So it might come down to actual cost of implement, implementation. If you're doing this in discrete components, if you're not worried about lift, uh, um, laying out a chip, you just, just might want to pick uh, for, your, for your particular application the cheapest component, probably a resistor. A simple resistive match is going to work fine in that case. Broadband, you don't have to worry about it. Oh, but wait, if power is a consideration, maybe you should go to the capacitive match. So I, there, there is no kind of one-size-fits-all. It's very situational depending on what you're being asked to do as an engineer, like everything in life, right? Yeah? Um, the video impedance will be about standard, right? That's a very standard um, impedance for a circuit board trace, yeah. If this was an internal trace on an actual chip, like you're connecting two cores, uh, it might be something different. They, sometimes they use non-standard impedance values for that. So the closer that your source resistance and your load resistance are to 
your impedance line like can also determine which method you use? Potentially, because that will determine how long the ringing will last, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that will also the length of your line will then um, tell you whether or not you can tolerate a little a little more ringing, smaller capacitor value maybe on your capacitive match. Good questions. It's nice to have a class that's awake. <laughs> this is good. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's do our next topic. Yes. You said that the current kind of falls off, but like, or breaks down. You kind of, maybe I don't understand it, but it seems like you're going into magic now. Where does it kind of go? Uh, well, what's happening? Where does the current go here? So what's happening is that you know the current charges are just avalanching across the PN junction. It can no longer hold hold back the current effectively. And so what's really happening is the device is heating up. Um, you know, it's still like any other device in that if you pick a quiescent point on it, the product of the voltage and the current. This area, effectively, is your power consumption. So the, you got to be careful with zeners that you can't operate them for a long period of time in reverse breakdown or else they will actually heat up and possibly self-incinerate. But that's not too big of a deal for these types of circuits because really it's just in breakdown long enough to, to suppress the ringing, which doesn't last that long. So that's not usually a factor in these types of matching designs. But it's, it's effectively acting like a resistor in that point. Well, I don't know about that. You never heard of that. Like, well, I mean, with rocket launchers and stuff, <laughs> like electrically blow up computers. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. You'll have to forward me the link. 